Haley and I will be discussing and analyzing Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Where do we even start? With the monkeys. We start with the monkeys, just like Kubrick did. Begin with the monkeys. Okay. So right. what's the deal with the like 20 minutes of monkeys? Why is that there? We really won't. Okay. We really won't know because you're not like really supposed to understand this. You're not. It's, you know, it's just. <laughs> it was just for, for fun, guys. <laughs> We didn't mean anything by it. Just, you know, put it on the background, like, while well, you do a puzzle or something and have fun with it, you know? <laughs> I went to the zoo one day and I saw the monkeys. And I thought, that that could be, a, like, half a movie. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> what if we just adapted a novel at the same time? That would be pretty neat. Oh, my goodness. And I didn't know it was a book. I, I I randomly came across the book. I didn't. I don't know anything about the oh, book really? other than the fact that there was a book before there was a movie. And I think it was written at the same time. Really? That must. I am pretty sure. That must have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? What's it about? I think, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Stanley Kubrick had like almost all. I think like all rights over the book, and he could say like what he wanted in it and what the author was forced to take out and stuff like that. Okay. Which is kind of interesting. That is interesting. But, yeah. I wonder what the book was about because the it must have had a story. Like they can't make you sit through 15 minutes of colors flying by in a book. <laughs> right. That's hilarious. Should have read though. the book. Before. I mean like how much time he spent with the monkeys at the beginning of that movie. Like, I don't know what that was. I still don't understand it. Like, the only that thing... Was, that was not nearly as excruciating as watching the colors fly across the screen. That was I'm easier like... for me. I was, like, into no, that. No. <laughs> that was, like, just so abstract. That was... I, I prefer that to just, like, zoo live feed, you know? Well, okay. Well, when you're watching the monkeys, you're like... What are they thinking? Like, what's <laughs> going on? Like, they're, like, actually doing stuff. And the colors okay. are just flying across the screen. Yeah, but you're seeing things. It's like it means something. Maybe. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the monkey's actions have more significant meaning than the colors. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess they did create all of humanity. But that's beside the point. Maybe it's not. <laughs> that's they, besides the point. <laughs> they were like, okay... The, the thing with, okay, here's what I remember from the monkeys. It's like you start the movie seeing all these landscapes. And then you see, well, they're not monkeys technically, they're apes. They don't have tails. They're apes. So you start the movie seeing the apes and they're just kind of going around being apes. And <laughs> they do that for like 15 minutes. And then they shelter in a cave at night. And then they go out one morning and this guy finds a bone and he starts smashing a skull with the bone and you kind of see mm -hmm. a little montage that's showing how they were able to dominate other species by using tools. And then yeah. it cuts to somebody who didn't want to use a bone and then he beats him up. And then he like the, the black obelisk comes down from the sky and then the planets <laughs> align and then he throws the bone up in the air and then it match cuts to a spaceship. And like, yes, OK, well, here that we was go. really cool. That, that, that was that's actually probably the very, very cool. That's the only part of the movie I really understand is that match cut because it's telling you the spaceship is just like a tool that the apes are using and that's what's setting them apart from other species. Right. And, and like it, in the a, people who utilize the tools survived. Exactly. So, yeah, that's how you get space treadmills and things. <laughs> yep. <laughs> space treadmills. My... Best guess about what the movie is about is I think it's trying to say that we're still evolving as humans and that we shouldn't resort to artificial intelligence. Like we're still Ooh. progressing. I mean, it's interesting the way that I, I kind of got the idea that the artificial intelligence, it was like the dawn of a new kind of man where it was like. The, in the same way that the monkey uses the bone, the artificial intelligence controls the spaceship. That's interesting. So it has control over the humans and it's becoming the dominant species. I mean, 
I guess the only thing is that the artificial intelligence was portrayed in a very negative way. Yes. <laughs> Obviously. Well, I think so, that that could be meaning that maybe humans are negative as well in the context of the film. That he's hinting that maybe we have gotten worse over time in the same way that this, this, uh, like, like, oh, it is like very violent the way that oh, the like, apes, the way the apes gain dominion over the other animals is by crushing them with bones and tools and things. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the artificial intelligence does is it uses its tools to push people away and try to kill them. That's interesting. And then it ends up using the tool of emotional manipulation, which doesn't end up working because of colors that fly by the screen for a little <laughs> while. Which is that really what happens? Like, am I remembering that correctly? When he's about to destroy the machine, then he gets flying through this thing. Like, I, I don't even know. It's funny in that movie, if you don't look at the timeline of it, like you have no idea how long things are taking. Mm -hmm. it it you That's lose true. track of everything it's like have we been watching this part for five minutes or 20 minutes like you don't know that's crazy yeah, that, that is a good point you really you don't know <laughs> you don't know i've never experienced um, that with another movie which i think that's part of the thing that left me in the end feeling like i was just spinning and like i don't know what's going on i don't know what's going on yeah because like i don't even know how long each part took i don't know what most of the movie was like did most of the movie take place on earth in space on that one base on like the moon or whatever that was on that spaceship like you don't meet the main character for a long time mm -hmm, that's true i'm it like you lose track of who's who like was the guy at the beginning on the spaceship the same guy as the guy at the end i don't think so it's just yeah. showing us technology and then it cuts away it's like yep people are in space all right, now to the moon. Okay, that's pretty cool. They found the obelisk. You remember that? Okay, now we're back in space again, watching news. I feel like most of the dialogue in that movie is from the news. Like, it's just watching TV in the story. And in screenwriting, that's generally looked down upon. Like, it's it's basically narration. Because mm -hmm. it's just t saying exactly what happened. It's, it's pure exposition. And we're just watching this guy run around while we're getting pure exposition. And for some reason, it's like it, it works because it's one of the greatest masterpieces of a film of all time. And it breaks like the number one rule of screenwriting, which is show, don't tell. Um, and it just tells us at that point. Or I guess the whole movie has been showing us things we don't understand. So it's like, OK, we're going to explain things for a little bit and then you're back on your own. It's like, OK. Yeah, that's interesting because the ending Ay, no ay, tell. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. There, the way that went down, there <laughs> could be so many different ways uh. of interpretation. <laughs> I don't, I just. We're beyond our depth. That's by far the most absurd ending <laughs> I've ever watched. <laughs> I've I have, never I have seen to anything agree like with that. that. I remember <laughs> saying of Spirited Away that it's the strangest thing I'd ever seen. Not just movie, but thing. I did not know what was coming. I had, <laughs> I was like walking onto train tracks without really looking where I was going. And then uh, like a train hit me. Like this, this is infinitely stranger than that. I mean, Spirit of the Way has pretty clear ideas in it. Um, compared yeah. to this, at least. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Uh, but I, I, do, I don't know. I don't know. I think... Maybe it's meant to leave you in that kind of spinning feeling of like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Oh, I'm sure it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's supposed to do that. But I mean, it's I'm it's going... violent in how confusing it is, if that makes sense. Like the tone is violent without being physically violent. Right. If you were just to watch this on like a surface level, it's very non-threatening. <laughs> Yeah, but if you but like, if you think about it, if you think about it for more than like ten seconds, you think, wait, what's actually going on here? Is this a kids' movie? I don't think so. <laughs> it's like I, I think I, while we were watching it, I made the joke that um, w what if someone's picking up their kids from preschool and they just see this like playing, like okay, time to go, everybody, like bye, <laughs> like what did you watch today? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I think it was about astronauts <laughs> yeah you'd be right in thinking that in some way 
But did did Stanley Kubrick ever give any hints whatsoever about what the point was? Like, what what, um, what is he doing? Not, I know, uh, I should have written more stuff down. When I was doing my research, there were a couple of things that he mentioned. But I did actually write a quote down. And I know I said earlier how the, I think that the film is about how the human race is still evolving and don't hand everything over to artificial intelligence. And I wrote this down. So Stanley Kubrick told, I think the New York Times Magazine, that somebody said man is the missing link between primitive apes and civilized human beings. We are semi-civilized, capable of cooperation and affection, but needing some sort of transfiguration to a higher form of life. Man is in really man is really in a very unstable condition. Oh boy. So Stanley. I know. <laughs> Stanley. What? So I do think that that kind of supports my theory. Yes, okay. I see that. But, but I want to know what you think. Well, according to Google, this film follows a voyage to Jupiter with this sentient computer, Hal, after the discovery of an alien monolith. It deals with themes of existentialism, human evolution, technology, artificial inter- intelligence, and the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Which is one way of saying, I don't know, it's about all these things. Like, It has themes of... Uh, the themes are definitely clear. Clearer than the story. Yeah. Like, clearer than the plot. This is the only time I've watched a movie where the themes are clearer than the plot. I mean... That's true. Like, the only clear plot you have is the 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 apes make tools and this computer is good but then it kills people because it doesn't like them interfering mm-hmm. with things so ay, ay, ay. what was the meaning of 2001 space odyssey it has been described as an allegory of human conception birth and death interesting that is interesting yes i also wanted to bring that up i do think that it is an allegory for the cycle of life. Okay. Because it's the, ma- mainly because of the ending, because you see him go, you see the main character go through, I forget how many, but clearly goes through certain stages of his life. Yes. He becomes an old and man. And then, and then he dies and he's reborn. Is that, is that him though? Like, I, or is that someone's is. random space child? I don't think it would make sense to just be somebody random. Okay. I feel like that just wouldn't make correlate with anything. Yeah. What if Hal is the monolith? What, does oh, that work? Interesting. I was going to ask you that later. What is the monolith? What is the point of that? Yes. Like it's there at the end of his life and it's there at the beginning of his life. And they discover it in the middle of his life. So weird. It's yeah. a weird, weird thing. And I don't know what it means. It's more threatening than any actual thing could be, though, because it's just like that shrieking noise and yeah. just looking at nothing. I do think it represents some sort of truth and some sort of... Do you think it represents the, the presence of death in different stages of life? Like, at the beginning, you've, you've kind of escaped death. Then in the middle, you're thinking about death like a midlife crisis. And then at the end, Ooh. it captures you because it zooms in on it at the end. It kind of envelops the whole screen. Oh, that would make sense. It yeah, because works. in the ending, very old and he's about to die. He's like reaching out to the monolith. Mm-hmm. That's right. I, I forgot about that. I do think that it could represent death, but I do kind of think it represents some sort of enlightenment almost. Interesting. Is death of the only reality? Like- <laughs> It is the only thing with clearly defined edges. What's the deal with using those ultra wide angle lenses too in space? I'm going to look that up. Initially, initially I thought that it meant that the artificial intelligence was still there or how was still there. But Maybe. I'm like, that wouldn't make very much sense. What year did it come out? Uh, 1968. You you are you are correct. The moment you said that, it popped up on Google for me. So, <laughs> that's a year before we actually got to the moon. That's interesting. Meaning he didn't actually know what it looked like, like Earth, f- 
looking at the moon or being on the moon and looking at earth there had been people in space before then but they hadn't been on any kind of terrain so it is interesting how accurate he got the way the moon looks yeah very yeah, interesting yeah that is interesting stanley um. kubrick faked the moon landing it's <laughs> funny i have a question for you specifically about the ending scene where he is sitting at the table and i think he's eating and he pushes his glass off the table and it shatters yes yes okay that felt very intentional what do you think was the purpose of that or what do you think that symbolized um i think it for like sitting there watching that it got my attention again as i was kind of like ready for the movie to be over (laughs) um it's like oh okay something loud broke nice um but maybe it means he's oh I'll, i'll get all philosophical about it so maybe and later in life he's less attached to physical possessions and so he's destroying this thing that he sees is not important anymore. And shortly after that, he's in bed. Like, I think it just cuts to him being, like, laying there. And then the monolith, like, envelops him. I keep saying that, but, like, it gets closer and closer. Without moving, it gets closer. The way that feels is so unique because he's able to use camera movement to make it feel like it's moving when it's not moving. In a similar way that in Star Wars, they did the visual effects by having the camera move towards these spaceships on its own plate, like with like a, a blue screen behind it. And they would cut them out, like hand rotoscope them. And it would look like it was moving because there's no background, but it's actually just the camera getting closer to it. It has that same feeling, but you see the background. And it's just this thing getting bigger and bigger without moving. It's just it's not actually changing it's just getting closer it feels closer without actually being closer Mm. i thought that was interesting i only answered your question at the very beginning of my little rant (laughs) yeah that's interesting i think i was the only person there who knew that the name of the guy was like the the artificial intelligence was called how and not hell oh i knew that but they sound similar yeah i think i wouldn't have noticed that it sounded like hell though so i think the fact that it's difficult to tell sometimes is that it's like it's intentional oh for sure but like does that go beyond just saying oh computer bad like burning in fire death forever or is it like more than that i think it just i think it's just saying artificial intelligence is bad Hmm. i think but i um I do want to know, what do you think, do you think that Stanley Kubrick is anti-artificial intelligence, like, on an extreme scale? Because this movie kind of makes me think he is, but I... I think maybe the book was about that. I don't know if... I don't know much about his feelings on technology. I mean, he used a really highly technical lens for a lot of this, which... (laughs) might be it might just be to serve the story he doesn't seem to be against using technology to me um but i think that maybe it was something to talk about like the space race because that was going on at the time and kind of what that might look like in the future and the bad side of it maybe i'm i'm not sure i really i don't know I feel like most of our conversations end with us agreeing that we have no idea what the movie was about. Yeah. <laughs> it's like with, with Spirited yeah. Away or Inception or like Citizen Kane, we're all like, yeah, that was a really interesting thing we just saw, but it's too bad we don't know what it means. Uh, that's funny. I do think that the Star Child represents the next... Um, stage in human phase, evolution stage yeah stage in human evolution okay um because he okay sorry i'm like you're like okay you're, you were making that sound and now i'm like <laughs> oh my gosh 
<laughs> this this thing. Oh my gosh. It's <laughs> I didn't even do it on purpose that time. What does it sound like for you? For me it sounds like like It's a horrible sound. <laughs> it literally is like nails on chalkboard. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to do it. <laughs> for me it just sounds like, you know, like corduroy pants. It's just like Yeah. <laughs> but what is like for you is it just like I don't know. Like my head kind of hurts right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Oh no. Psychological warfare. Anyways. I think that the star child at the end represents the next phase in human evolution and also the unknown aspects because it's such a... I don't want to say it's boring because it's definitely not boring, but it's just so basic. It's like, it's just a baby. I am space baby in bubble. This is Kubrick's yeah. message. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It, okay, so the baby is in a bubble. Is that a, is that a aesthetic or is that like meaning? I think it has meaning. I think it could represent. The, this child is possibly separated. The, deli- the delicateness of human nature i don't know if you were to say delicacy of human nature it would sound like a like a special food yeah i know yeah I, that's why i didn't want to say that <laughs> the delicacy <laughs> of human nature um uh. i think that it probably means i mean the fact that you don't begin with the with the child but you end with the child is interesting to me because I think it emphasizes something yeah. different than if we started, like if we ended just when he died when he was old. Uh, and it's one of the most iconic parts of the movie. Like if you look up 2001 Space Odyssey, mm-hmm. you'll see him walking down a hallway and you'll see a spaceship and you'll see the child floating in space. You Maybe you'll see the monolith too. But I think the fact that when, you, oh, you go through the monolith to see the child in space. Oh. So, but you also see the child hovering over the bed um, when he dies, presumably. Yeah. Like, like it just cuts and then he's not there anymore and there's this thing floating above. And the child is like the same size as like a person. It's like really mm-hmm. big. And then at the end, it could be the size of the earth <laughs> or not. Like a perspective yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's There's weird. So much Sorry. Like, oh no, it's okay. I was. I'm not adding really any insight. I just said it. It's weird. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I feel like I'm just not like analyzing very well today. <laughs> That's fine. I I don't know that I have any particularly profound insights about this movie just because I don't understand it. Yeah, it's. It's it's the only movie I've actually seen that is, well. Oh, oh, I'm going to make such an interesting comparison right now. The only film that I think is comparable in the sense that it has a very, very loose plot with one distinguishable thread is Napoleon Dynamite. Now, <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> I hear you out. Okay. Hear me out. <laughs> Napoleon Dynamite follows all these random little characters. And you do start at the beginning. You see kind of how he lives. In the same way as as one might observe apes in a prehistoric society use tools and things, but but like you see like the main part of that movie is him helping his friend at the talent or it's like a talent show for him to become president of the school. So have you seen Napoleon Dynamite? I actually have not. No. Okay. Wait. I Are know. We, I should save this analysis for when we talk about that because it's a. It's a quite a unique movie, <laughs> um, but it's much easier to understand, I think, than uh, than 2001 Space Odyssey. But another yeah, interesting I thing about it is it completely breaks screenwriting conventions also, um, mm. and it works for whatever reason. It maybe not completely breaks them, but it definitely bends every rule. Like it does the it tells you instead of showing you a lot of things. It has no really clear theme 
it's it's got all these weird little vignettes of different things that never really connect to anything in the end and then the ending is just like it's like okay the, wow okay that was that's the end of the movie <laughs> um that was a wild ride and it also has one of the first post credit scenes in any movie ever um which doesn't add much to the actual i mean it adds a little bit to the actual story but it's mostly kind of there and it's it really entertaining but again it doesn't do that much although it does yeah. end with a new beginning in the same way that uh 2001 space odyssey does I, I think it's hilarious that i've just compared those two movies yeah i think that's <laughs> funny i i I don't really know what to say about that. I was like comparing Inception <laughs> to the Lego movie. I'm so good yeah, at this. It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. Now, yeah. where does he go when the colors get there? Where is that? Is that inside of Hal? Is that the... like? Because you, you transition from looking at this inside of the computer to the swirling lights and then it goes somewhere else. Oh, I think that. Wait, you can go. <laughs> is is that the trip to Jupiter? Is that Hal taking over the 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 spaceship? And then like maybe they they see these different land forms on an alien planet. Then maybe they crash into a alien society or something. And perhaps time works differently there. And so he can see himself from outside his body or that was just so psychologically damaging oh. that he's insane now. Perhaps. I think that it would make sense if Jupiter had a different like time. Yeah. Or in this because idea. Because also I do I do think that the lights <laughs> the light show mm -hmm. I think that does show him traveling to another dimension. Okay. So this new dimension could have an entirely different time. Like, you know, if you yeah. know what I'm trying to say. Yes, yes. Like a so wormhole. time could work differently there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And another interesting thing is we might be able to find out more about what each part of the movie means if we chart it over a traditional structure for a movie, like in screenwriting. Oh, yeah. So if you do that, I think that the light show ends up on either... Oh, I have I have this chart. I'm gonna pull it up. The All is Lost, Dark Knight of the Soul, or the Break into Act Three. And the finale mm. is him in that room. And then the final image is the baby floating in space. Which means the fun in games, which is supposed to be the main part of a movie, is him on the spaceship with Hal. So that is technically the main part of the movie. So actually, this makes a lot of sense. This doesn't really break screenwriting conventions. It just uses them in crazy ways. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So it's not like, you know what? It might not be like Napoleon Dynamite after all. <laughs> the midpoint happens when he is trying to shut down Hal. And then bad guys close in must be. I got to send you this chart because I'm just reading random okay. things to you. <laughs> Um, th basically there's this structure that has 15 points on it that was mm. laid out by a screenwriter named Blake Snyder. And, uh, it's, it's pretty much followed by every single movie you'd be able to name other than a very mm -hmm. select handful. Basically this kind of fits it. So it goes opening image. The opening image of this movie is the landscape on earth, right? Mm -hmm. And the closing image is the baby floating in space with the earth behind it then themes stated it is supposed to happen right after the opening image that's the part when we watch apes like play with bones for a little while and then the setup that's also the setup the catalyst is the oh that's perfect the catalyst is the ape using the bone and that sets the whole plot into action it, like Interesting. directly but if you look at it from yeah. like a, a long long timeline that's what it is and then after that, in the normal screenplay comes the debate. I'm not certain what the debate is in this. I, oh, no. Uh, yes, I yeah. am. The debate is whether or not he's going to go to um, 
go to the planet because there's like some sickness yeah. or something. And he ends up mm -hmm. going because that's all a cover up for the monolith. Break into act two. The only thing that we get from that is the character has to make a clear decision. And that is this guy goes to the moon. And then the B story. Oh, it fits perfectly. Wait, this is crazy. Okay. The B story is the, the like United States uncovering the monolith on the moon. And mm -hmm. they're kind of mentioning the Jupiter expedition when they're doing that. They don't they don't directly talk about it, I think, but they mention it a few times. Fun and games, we finally get to the Jupiter expedition and we watch all we watch them exercise and stuff when we learn about all that. Then the midpoint, he has to go into space and replace this thing. Um, and then he has to make an action or decision that propels him into the new the new act, which is the bad guys close in. Hal starts becoming more threatening. Then he loses his, his friend in space. All is lost. Hal is taking control of the ship and he doesn't seem like he's going to be able to get away. Dark Knight of the Soul, he is trying to break Hal apart and it's not working. Break into Act 3, something happens with the colors and he makes a clear decision. I think, does he make a clear decision? Maybe that's when he breaks Hal. Or tries to. That's a clear decision. And then yeah. the, f the finale is the colors and then being on the planet. Mm -hmm. And the final image is the baby floating in space. So we just mapped out the whole thing. And I have no, I had no idea it fit the structure that well. That's crazy. It feels like a yeah, mad... That, I, I am very surprised that it fit that structure. Yeah. That well. That's very surprising to me. This is the kind of structure they use for comedy movies. And like <laughs> normal things. I, I did yeah. not think it would fit that so well. Mm -hmm. That's insane. That's that crazy. Insane. Wow. Nice. Yeah, you can't see my expressions, but I'm pretty amazed. <laughs> when we were watching the movie together, I remember hearing you say this, that when the colors were, um, when the, you know, when the light show happened. Yes. And they put filters over his eyes and they did like filter after filter. And then finally it was normal. Yeah. And I remember you saying that that felt the most threatening is that yes you said that was more disturbing than the filters right and that happened after he unplugged how yeah and i think that that kind of is like he's almost having like an epiphany like he's realizing that his life isn't gonna like be the same like they've adapted to this artificial intelligence oh his humanity and they relied is restored. on it to Right, and they've just, they've relied on it for so many things to get to Jupiter to yeah, basically live. And now that's been taken away from him. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, definitely that for sure. And so throughout that whole sequence, he's kind of, everything's chaos. And you see, you hear his breathing, I think. Um, and mm -hmm. when it cuts back to him, it gets closer and closer every time and it's a different colors. So it's always like he's being filtered through something. Ooh. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Okay. That totally fits because when people are speaking, it's always through some kind of device at that point. The dialogue is always being filtered through things. So having these colored filters over his face is another expression of that. So the technology is obscuring their actual human characteristics. Oh. Um, and that's the same thing for the natural landscapes. They look so awful and alien as he's being the, as these filters are going on him and things are being reflected and craziness. And then like, I remember the sky being reflected in a lake and like the clouds are on the ground and things like that. And then after he sees all that, it cuts to the closest shot of his eye and that's just normal. Like there's no filters on it. Yeah. And that's like the most striking part of that whole sequence because you see all this craziness and just to see his normal eye, it stands out so much. And then it cuts to when he's at the, uh, sorry, I pounded on my desk. That might've been really loud for you. Um, <laughs> it's okay. And then it cuts to when he's in that weird like room watching himself eat. Like you don't even see him for like a minute or two. He's just walking very carefully and you see this door. And I think that puts you in the same, the same state of mind that he had. Maybe he didn't actually see all those colors and things, but that's how he felt when he got there, maybe that's what it is. So maybe. he's like, that's not what actually happened. It's just how he felt when things happened. Like after Hal takes him to Jupiter and Hal wasn't able to kill him 
he ends up somewhere and he doesn't really understand what's going on, but he sees himself from outside himself. And he's seen his whole life up to this point as this chaotic mess after he tried to fight back against technology. He had his humanity restored, but he's in this completely alien world with no reference of reality. And then death comes to take him and he becomes something new or something new comes from him. Mm -hmm. And then it comes back to earth through death, which could be a metaphor for natural selection. There's a lot of things that I think represent like a cycle, like the cycle of yes. humanity, I guess. Even the round spaceship that it turns and yeah, he walks forever. I was, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking of when the guy was like running and punching the air. Yeah. He was running in a continuous circle. I think that's a good observation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And well, then also at the end... I think you already said this, but, you know, we start at Earth and then we end at Earth, looking at the Earth. Yeah. The reason it's the closest that Stanley Kubrick comes to being Hayao Miyazaki. He has these very slow, still moments that you're meant to just feel what's going on. It's meant to have mm -hmm. a very thick kind of atmosphere in space where there is no atmosphere. It's supposed to be a very dense, emotional feeling that's like it's very clear like this movie has a very clear mood to it um uh -huh, throughout sure. the whole thing you just feel this weird way and Miyazaki does that too in a very similar way where he just has these little scenes like something that's stuck out to me is in every Miyazaki film you see how the characters live in all these different situations and he does that in this movie in the exact same way where you see what they eat, how they get what they eat, where they sleep, and what they do for work. In every single situation. You see that with mm -hmm. the apes. You see that with the humans on the first spaceship. You see that with the humans on the second spaceship. And you even see that at the very end in that finale. You see where he sleeps, what he does, and what he eats. And how he don't see how he gets his food, though. But I, I think that's really interesting. Because that creates... A kind of understanding of humanity like these are real people and they actually have to sleep and they have to eat and they have to do these things that's one thing that makes Miyazaki's films so compelling with their world building is that you can see how they live there and you can imagine yourself living there because you see what they do all the little quirks of daily life that makes it real and he yeah. makes such a clear effort to do that in every single moment of this movie that I can't believe I just realized it just now yeah I think that's a great observation why, thank you. I do. I agree with that. <laughs> I think that's it's very interesting. It's a very interesting comparison. Because two very different people. Yes. Not quite as different as uh, 2001 Space Odyssey and Napoleon Dynamite, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Though my comparison between those two is not, like, it doesn't end up holding up because it does. This one does follow screenwriting conventions and Napoleon Dynamite still doesn't. Maybe it does. Maybe when we review that at some point in the future, I'll go through this list and be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. It's just like 2001 Space Odyssey after all. <laughs> but just the fact that I that I compared them, I think is hilarious and we should keep that in. <laughs> I We can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> it would, if nothing else, it would make a good short on YouTube. And, and putting this That's little true. clip in that would also make it more meta, which which makes people feel like they're in the know. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> look at That's me funny. rhyming it's very very fun <laughs> thoughts on the monolith because i feel like that's a very important part of the movie yes that, so a very important part of the movie and we, we haven't talked about it i think much. one thing we need to mention is the fact that at the beginning the monolith points towards the moon and you see the sun and they're lined up in the same way when they're on the moon it points towards the earth and the sun interesting so it's Ooh, maybe it points to where humanity is going next. So now that they're they're Interesting. the monkeys in millions of years, or apes in millions of years are going to end up on the moon. They're going to be living there. And then at the end of the movie, the the human embryo comes back to the earth after being enveloped by the monolith. That is interesting. But what does it represent if it's pointing to where humanity will go? Let me think about this. I'm not sure. I don't know. I was really into your 
death theory. Okay. But then I thought, I just think it represents absolute truth. Hmm. I don't know how else to say that. I just... Something Absolute about truth. it feels like that because it's just so bland. Maybe, um, like, to if, if you look at it from, like, a very nihilistic point of view... It could be saying that death is the only absolute truth for for the natural world. And yeah. it's, it's interesting that the artificial intelligence is able to surpass death because it's not a real living entity. It, it can't be killed. Not in the traditional way anyway. Mm -hmm. But that that is something interesting to consider. It's certainly the like a major symbol of the film, like within the film. It means something in that reality. We don't know what, though. I don't think we know what. Yeah. I find it interesting. I f it, it, it's like a rectangle, right? Is it? Yeah. Or was it triangular? Was it triangular? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Was it? It was rectangular. Great. But I do know that it was a different shape in the book. Really? What shape was it in the book? I am not sure, but I do, I'm 100% sure that it was different. The monolith appears in 2001 Space Odyssey at pivotal moments in history to provide a higher consciousness to whomever comes across its path. When the apes discover the monolith during the first chapter of 2001, it's implied the mysterious slab teaches the animal species to use bones as weapons. Interesting. Mm hmm That's interesting. And then there's a whole bunch of pictures on Google of people photoshopping it into normal situations in life. <laughs> that's actually really funny going to the beach oh my with gosh. my monolith we should we should post a picture on instagram and photoshop the monolith <laughs> that would be great <laughs> it's like a selfie you just like do a, a facetime picture and then just like put it in the background <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> that'd be funny it might just look like a black rectangle but actually that's what it is Oh my goodness. Oh, ooh, wait. The Dawn of Man is what the title says. There's a title card at the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. It says the Dawn of Man. And when you see the monolith, the sun is peeking over the edge of it and moving. So it's coming up. It's the Dawn of Man because not because the sun is coming up oh. over the horizon of the earth, but because it's coming up over the horizon of the monolith. That is interesting. Yes, yes. Okay, so when it sees, like when you're looking at the monolith on the moon and you're seeing the earth, there is an eclipse. Oh, really? The eclipse bro blocks out the sun. Perhaps implying it's the end of man. Interesting. Not the dawn of man. Huh. What, how would you rate? Uh, um, 2001, A Space Odyssey, on a scale of 1 to 10. I mean, like, okay, okay. Um, like, how would you rate, like, a kaleidoscope with pictures of space travel? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it looks pretty cool. I think I understand, mm, like, 0.5% of it. <laughs> um, I, I, oh my goodness. I'm not going to rate it for any meeting that... Any other meaning that I assume is in there, like I'm only going to use what I know that I know about it, giving it like and considering cinematography and like choices they made in the story and how fun it is to watch or not. I'm going to give it a solid 7.5 out of 10. Okay. Okay. It's definitely a good movie. I think that's like, hard to argue. It's <laughs> like I think I think that's hard to argue against. I mean, like it it's it's one of cinema's greatest films ever. And I'm I was rating it based on how much I enjoyed it and what I got from it. But if I was rating it based on like how good the film is objectively, like objectively it's probably a like a nine or ten out of ten. But I can't know that mm -hmm. because I'm not unbiased. <laughs> so yeah yeah it's 
there's just too much that I don't understand. Yeah. And I personally did not enjoy it. And even <laughs> the message that I'm getting from it, I'm not not I, really I don't like enjoying the message it. <laughs> either. But it's yeah. just a little it's just kind of it's just kind of sad. I don't know. I don't definitely I don't know sad. how I feel about people telling me technology's bad. <laughs> I think that's just because we had to do like a school thing about it and I didn't like that. But um, <laughs> I think I do think that the um, special effects are incredible. Definitely. Especially considering when the movie was made. It's very yeah. impressive. For sure. So I'm going to give it a seven out of ten. That is fair. That's reasonable. And for some reason, it doesn't make me sad. Sorry, Kubrick. <laughs> but like, I'm sure uh, your other movies are good. Headlines: S- Random teenagers give Kubrick's masterpiece <laughs> seven point five out of ten. <laughs> oh my gosh, that'd be that'd be so funny. Burn them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's not personal. We just don't have the brain capacity. I hate you. I hate your movie and I hate you. <laughs> That's why I gave it a low rating in a random podcast, like in no official setting whatsoever. <laughs> no, it's a good movie. It's definitely a movie mm-hmm. I will watch again and again and hopefully understand more. I watch it. I, I bet the next time we watch it, I mean, if you ever do watch it again, it'll probably be like, you'll see a whole different movie in the movie. Yeah. I think it, it feels like it has a lot more that we didn't see. I think it's good that we recognize that in so many movies we've done because everything we have done yeah. has so much in it that we can't really know what everything means. Um, so our awareness of that, I think, is good. But then again, we we still don't know what we're talking about, but that's the fun <laughs> part. True. Yeah. 